very much for taking time this morning to be with us in this webinar, uh, which I think is very, very important, uh, given that we are in a very unique time uh, in our economy. Uh, before I go further, I want to introduce you to our panel members um, and thank them for taking time because they too are very busy and they've been kind enough to allocate this hour, hour and a half to be with us. I would like to introduce uh, Benny Tan. Uh, Benny is a friend, a good friend, um, and somebody I admire a lot because you know he built his business from a shop house, uh, second floor, I think, of a shop lot. And today, you know, it's uh, grossing almost half a billion dollars in sales. Um, it's almost a giant you know, industry. And, you know, when I wanted to do this webinar, I thought of Benny because uh, Benny will give us a perspective of the economy in terms of food, which is kind of linked to where we are. But Benny will also give us a perspective because he does distribute into pharmacies with brands like Fisherman's Friend, Equal. So, you know, kind of gives you some feel of where the interface between pharmacy business and the food business. Then um, our co-sponsor, IQVIA, Mai here. Uh, and Mai will, you know, they use, most of us know that company as Nielsen. Uh, and Mai will give you some perspectives of COVID, some, some data that she has on COVID. Uh, I've not seen it. I look forward to seeing it. You know. And of course, you know, the... Um, Zulik Pharma is the giant in our industry in terms of distribution by far. And uh, I have the pleasure of uh, having uh, Louis George Lesnery join us. Um, as his name suggests, he's French. He just joined, he just came to Malaysia in January. And again, he must be very busy and he's very kind to give us time. So let me first give a quick overview. A quick overview of uh, what are, are my thoughts and where we are as a, uh, in terms of this business going forward with some of my own perspectives on where we are as a business. So, you know, the Google searches on the word unprecedented have been all time high. People trying to make a sense of where we are, where's our place right now, right? And in our business, you know, we have seen unprecedented changes too, whether it's pharmacy, chain, distribution business, right? And I want to share some of my, some, some of my um, uh, uh, perspectives, right? So I, you know, I, I call, I mean, we used to call AC as, and B, B, BC as before Christ and AD as after the layer of our Lord, anti Actually now, you know, from now on, BC is before COVID, and AD is after distancing. It's a new normal. Um, and it's not going to be a very pleasant normal if you're not prepared for it. Okay. So today's event, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will have Benny, Benny Tan start off uh, giving his thoughts and perspectives of the industry. And then IQVIA. And then uh, Louis George or, or, or LG as he prefers to be called. And then I would like that we have some discussions um, of our industry coming from the audience and a way forward i would like us um, a platform that we choose whether the mps or matsa from this webinar to make some recommendations to the government on what they can do and how they can support us as a business beyond just you know pouring money and funding in terms of how they can help us in terms of regulation and all that and I don't know this business as much as all of you do. I don't know this business as much as you do also in terms of regulation. So um, we look forward to your feedback on how we think the government can help the chain pharmacies, the retail business going forward. So if you go back and look, right, this is the economist, uh, this is uh, COVID, right? So we have an uncome, uh, uncome newcomer in our midst, right? Uh, already in the first four months of this year, COVID is the number one killer of human beings. 
it's beaten everybody else from cancer to road accidents to diabetes, suicides, falls, malaria, heart right? And even if we stop, even if COVID was stopped tomorrow, um, by the end of the day, it will still be the top 10. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, it still continues to, to increase as of yesterday. Uh, it's increasing in every region in the world. Um, uh, quite to the surprise of everybody who thought that with the summer, the Northern Hemisphere will be free of, um, of, uh, of COVID. It's not the case. Uh, and, you know, so this is going to put us into some kind of a spin. This is Wong Chun Wai writing in the star. He says, unless you are in a business of selling masks, surgical gloves, ventilators, and supplying boxes of food deliveries, the reality is the rest of us have become poorer. And if you haven't a pay cut, go on, on unpaid leave, or at least ask to clear your annual leave, it could only mean that you must be working in the civil service or for employers with accessibility problems. Right? So that's the reality. Right? We have a, a new normal that is quite scary. So this is US. Look at the jobless claims. That's not a computer error on the screen, right? Look at 2020 in terms of jobless claims, the highest by far in more than 40 years. And um, sorry. And um, this is the uh, the real GDP. As you can see, it's falling off the cliff uh, in quarter one of, of this year. And the US is the largest economy in the world. What happens there? unfortunately affects us all and you know sadly projections are it would take two years at least to power uh, a lot longer to get back to the new normal um, we can expect some very dark economic clouds ahead right um, every country every major economy is going to have negative growth um, you know, even an economy like India has a negative 9% growth, Brazil and, and, um, and Euro have a negative 10% growth, right? The best of us is China, and that's a negative 5% growth. So very, very dark economic clouds ahead. Now, let's come to Malaysia, which is closer to home. Um, we are, have already the highest uh, rate of uh, unemployment since March now, and it's only getting worse, uh, with more bad news to come, I think, as we go forward. Uh, they expect tax revenues to decline. They're already declining. It's going to decline further, which is going to damage our coffers. Um, and Petronas dividends tend to increase in a crisis, but Petronas itself is being hit very badly by the fall of the oil prices. Um, obviously, you know, and it's relevant to all of us, is the rise of e-commerce. Just in 2020, there have been 2.5 billion visits to Amazon, right? That's a 65% increase over the same period last year. In China, a quarter of all physical goods were bought via e-commerce in the first four months of this year. And in the US, Uber Eats has seen a 54% increase uh, in business. So consumers are now uh, finding ways to talk directly to the brands. Um, and for all of us who are in the business of retailing, that's going to be a huge challenge that we need to uh, look for, uh, worry about or plan for. So as I said, you know, to, uh, from this uh, seminar now, I would like that we mode as a group and come up with some recommendations for the government on how uh, we can possibly weather this storm together. And following that, uh, make some media release as a retail business and a retail industry going forward. Yeah. So that's it from my point, just to give an overview of where we are. Uh, I want now to invite uh, Benny to give his thoughts from personal and from a GBA perspective. Benny, over to you. Thank you, Dato. And uh, 
thanks for having me in this forum. And please meet LG and uh, Mai as well. And good morning to everybody else. I don't have any chart to show, so I'll just speak as I go along. You know, about, uh, a, about a month ago, I was talking to a friend of mine in Bangkok about COVID-19. And he told me, he said, even though he has got no experience in the world war, he said the current COVID-19 is probably worse than a world war. He said in a world war, you know who your friends are, you know who your enemies are, and you can see your enemies. But unfortunately, in the current scenario, the enemy is everywhere, and we can't even see them. Your best friend next to you may be a carrier of the virus without his knowledge or without your knowledge as well. So it's a very dicey position where we are in today. You know, this scenario is new to all of us. None of us has experienced this before. I haven't anyway, you know. You know, I have never heard of social distancing until about six months ago. It's a new vocabulary for me. But now I'm hearing it every day. I mean, in my whole life, I've never washed my hands so many times. And I can never imagine that one day my hand will consume more alcohol than my mouth. I, in, in the past, you know, the, the recession, or the financial crisis is only affecting us financially. We only suffer financially. We can still go out to exercise. We can still go out to socialize. We can even go to the pub to drown our sorrow. But today the experience is totally different. The MCO forces us to stay home, social distancing, alternate work days in the office. It's a totally new experience, a new way of life for us. Now, just allow me to, to have a little diversion from this topic of COVID-19. In 1985 and 86, Malaysia experienced the first recession. And that was caused by the uh, hike in the interest rate in America. And thereby affecting our commodity prices. 11 years later, in 1997, we have the Asian, the ASEAN, sorry, financial crisis. We have all our currency are being walloped left, right, and center. And it was a very painful period for every one of us. Another 11 years later, we have another recession. And it was caused by the American property bubbles. It was 2008 and 2009. And of course, as a small country, we suffer accordingly. 11 years later, 2020, we are talking about COVID-19. Now, the impact 
of COVID is a structural one. When I say structural, because it affects not only us financially, it also affects the way we work, the way we socialize, the way we play, and the way we live. In other words, it's a new experience for all of us. If you think about it, how many of us has got enough confidence to go into a train today, or go into a bus today, or taking a flight? All of us would have that fear of the unseen enemy, the unseen virus that may be hanging around us. Because it is almost impossible to physically identify a carrier. Then I want to put another scenario to all my partners here. Imagine six months ago, six months ago, can anyone imagine that a security guard standing in front of your pharmacy taking the temperature of your doctor customer who is coming to your pharmacy that will never that wasn't uh, the scenario anyone expect on the same basis six months ago nobody would expect you can walk into a bank with a face mask. So, because of the COVID, it changes everything. Now, because COVID affects us on a structural basis, it is therefore a game changer for all of us irrespective where you are, whether you're a retailer, you're a manufacturer, you're a customers, everybody is going to be facing a big change in life. What we can foresee from our company side is that the digital infrastructure and artificial intelligence are going to play a very pivotal role for us moving forward. The growth of the business and the business opportunity will also be linked to technology from now on, or more rely on technology from now on. Therefore, for us as a, as, as, as a supplier or even as a retailer, this will be key for us. This area will be a key area for us to address and take her on. To tie in together with the digital infrastructure and artificial uh, intelligence aspect of the total equation, we must also have human resources that are equipped with the knowledge of digital development as well as AI to support this sector or this section of our our growth plan. Then with the during this period we all see there's a surge in the 
in the online purchases of our customers. Now, this will, with this trend, personally and uh, us from our company side, we see it's going to be a, a, an increasing trend. And the development of these online purchases will also be accelerated by the consumer and the customers. So for us as an operator, uh, whether it's in the retail side or in the supplier side, then we have to ask ourselves one question. Are we going to have more brick and mortar operation? Or are we going to improve on our virtual site? If you look before COVID for, for a pharmacy or for a, a retail operator, logistic was never a major consideration because the supplier will supply the goods virtually to your doorsteps. The customer will come to your retail outlets to buy what they want and take away. But the COVID-19 has changed that model. Even your outlet itself, you will limit the number of customers walking into your store for safety reasons during this period. And the customer themselves will also demand for the products to be delivered to their house. And because of this development, you will need a very good logistic support as well to support this green sector of your business. Because the old business model of customer coming to your retail outlets and make purchases will be less. Now, then the other thing which we, from our point of view, which we think will affect the retail operation is because of the increase on the online purchase, because of the increase in the usage of digital um, instrument, the next question or the next area we will see is that as a retailer, do we need to have more brick and mortar, number one. And number two, what is our back-end support? In other words, what is my logistical warehouse support to meet this demand from the customers in terms of deliveries, in terms of inventory control, and in terms of the type of customer we have and their purchasing patterns. Therefore, from our point of view, from what we expect to happen is that there will probably be a, a slower growth of brick and mortar operation, but an increasing usage of a warehouse operation to support the changing trend in purchasing. So, the key here is also with all these changes, it must also come with a management commitment to develop the human resources to meet this changing need. Um, basically, this is uh, our view, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any question if you have any. Benny, before I go to the next uh, panelist, uh, very quickly, Benny, how has the business been for you 
March, April, May. And how do you see June and how do you see the rest of the year? For us, the month of March, April, May are very good months for some of our products in the grocery side, especially. Uh, we just do not have enough product to supply to our customers. I think this is cause, the reason for this is because number one, I think everybody uh, try to increase their kitchen inventory by stocking more at home. And number two, because during the MCO, they cannot go out and they tend to have more food preparation at home, whether it's cooking or baking. Therefore, in, in this part of our business, we are doing very well. However, uh, in our food service side of it, whereby we supply to hotels, mm. restaurants, catering, service provider, that is badly affected. That is badly affected. So, if you look at on the company as a whole, the site that have done very well has more than covered the section that is not doing well. Right? Um, if you ask me to look into the crystal ball, what is going to happen in the next six months, I think it's going to be a very challenging time for us. It's going to be a very challenging time for us. I hope I answer your question. Better. Thank you, Benny. Thank you. Yeah. So, yes, we are in uncharted waters. These are unprecedented times, right? Let's hear what Mai is going to say from an IQ point of view. Hi. Okay, sure. All right. Thank you, Dato and uh, Benny, for the sharing and the introduction. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and doing well. Um, my name is Mai. I'm from IQ via Consumer Health in Malaysia. Um, as we all know that the home world is now experiencing such an ex unexpected situation by COVID-19. And uh, I'm very happy today to share with you IQVR's point of view about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Malaysia healthcare market. So this is our initial thinking based on the available data that we have on, um, on COVID-19 impacts on the healthcare environment in Malaysia. Because in IQVR, we are the human data science company. We focus on healthcare and we, we are always ready to help reduce impact of COVID-19 today while driving the healthcare forward. So in today's presentation, in today's sharing with you, I will use um, IQVS proprietary data and also our expert network as a primary basis for assessment. We use the national sales audit data until April 2020. National sales audit is the direct sales in data from distributor to pharmacy clinic and hospital channels. We also interview with key stakeholders and market participants and industry executives in Southeast Asia. We ran online survey with doctors in Southeast Asia market and pharmacists in Malaysia to get the insight about how the market looked like. We will also use the like the epidemiological data public from WHO, academic institution and the government agencies. For today, I'll talk quickly about the situation in Southeast Asia. I know Dato and Tabani have given the big uh, introduction, so I will go very quickly on that. The impacts on products and healthcare, because as uh, Benny just said, uh, some categories are in the search, some categories are badly impacted. So uh, how about the healthcare, what product and what channels are really benefiting from the COVID-19? And lastly, some changing ways of working. So as we can see that the entire region of Southeast Asia has changed significantly since January 31st, 2020. Bank Negara Malaysia also forecast 2020 GDP growth in the range of minus 2% to 0.5% only. And IMF also revised the projected GDP for Asian 5 from 4.8% to minus 0.6%. 
We also see that more than 15 million people lost their job for the business holding. And uh, for the government of Southeast Asia, they have been setting more than 100 million US dollars to limit the economic impact from the pandemic on the country. And we all see that COVID-19 has changed each one of us professionally and personally lifestyle. It has far reaching the effect on the national health system and healthcare services. I will talk about more details uh, in the next few minutes, but overall the key three impacts on the healthcare that we want to share today. Firstly, is a fluctuating demand for the health products. Because due to COVID-19, we see the surge in certain products for the prevention and treatment purposes. We also see about the decline of healthcare service utilization because people are cautious about traveling. And because of the unexpected, we also see the unpredictability in the supply chain. All right. So let, let's deep dive into the first impact, the fluctuation in the demand for the health products. So when we look into our national sales audit data from January until April 2020 versus the same period last year, we can see that the top three categories in terms of value growth are cough, cold, respiratory, vitamin and supplement, and skin treatment. So we see some products are declining and some products are increasing. And these top three products are very much in line to consumers' demand about immunity boosting and also to cure quickly any symptom related to nasal, related to skin and throat so that they can minimize the chance of coronavirus infection. Or even we can see the topical nasal preparation and vitamin C combination even increase more than 100%. And actually, if we look into the monthly data, again, it is still the national sales audit data, but we break into month to see that where the search is from or when the search happened. For vitamin and supplement, the trend actually surged in January when the lockdown in Hubei started. And it hit the peak during the MCO time in March. So we see that when consumers start to have the demand or search the demand for the immunity boosting, manufacturers have been well, very well prepared to stock on the products in, in the store. And the drop in April was due to the full stock in March. That's why that we see the drop in March, uh, in April, but we expect it to be bounced back. Um, why is that? Why we expect the drop bounce back? Because when we talk about the next six month trend, then the top category in demand are still very much relevant to immunity boosting and the first life of defense. So not only the first life defense like face mask and disinfectant are in demand, but a lot of cough and cold multivitamin supplement uh, especially vitamin C, are still very much in demand in, in the next six months. Secondly, we also see the fluctuation in the demand in terms of channel. This is still our national sales audit data by month trend from March 2019 until April 2020. And we break into channel to see that which channel really got the surge and which channel is suffering. So pharmacy is in the blue light here. Private hospital is shown in the yellow line. And lastly, the gray line indicates the sales in the clinic channel. So over the past one year, pharmacy has turned to be the top purchase channel, especially it hit the peak during the MCO period started. Because when people start to control their movement and afraid to go to hospital and clinic, then pharmacy become the top purchase channel. And also we can see this is time when people are rushing to make the purchase for the immunity boosting. That's why that uh, we see the surge in the pharmacy channel here. The drop in April again, it was due to on the stop in, in March. That's why that uh, we see the drop in April, but expected to be bounced back in the, in the coming months due to um, the demand is still there in the next six months. So um, how can we leverage on that? Seeing that pharmacy is the core channel for, for um, in terms of the retail channels here. So the second impact is the decline in the healthcare services uh, utilization. 
when we interview doctors across Southeast Asia, we see that not only the sales in hospital and clinic decline, but also the number of outpatient visits to food form also decline in hospital and clinic by more than 60%. Just because patients are avoiding hospital and they're only coming in if they have some severe symptoms. Doctors in Malaysia also expect that it will take four to six months to get back to normal. And in this situation, they tend to give the double duration so that patients can limit or can minimize the frequency of travel visits. Not only that, we also see that doctors also expect the decrease in the inpatient visits, also because they are afraid of the chance of getting infected. And in terms of elective surgery, doctors also see that it declined or it decreased greatly by um, 70%. Because hospitals need to utilize the medical resources for COVID-19 treatment and also, again, to reduce the risk of infecting. And the last thing is on the medical tourism. All the country are expecting the negative impact on medical tourism. And especially even after the post-lockdown, post, post lockdown, doctors still expect the low level of medical tourism. So in this situation, it's very critical that um, healthcare really need to leverage on the technology, on the tools like uh, digital consultancy, so that we can adapt to the new normal. The third impact is on the unpredictability in the supply chain. So we have seen the increase of import essential drugs. When we talk to distributors, they have uh, reported the expedited acquisition of the essential drugs through the import routes. All the countries are importing essential medicines and providing it to hospitals, including the vir antiviral drugs and equipment. Hydroxychloroquine ran out of stock quickly once it was announced potential COVID treatment. But it may change um, in, in a very soon time because just a few days ago, when we hear when we heard the um, Malaysia DG Health EG already announced that they stopped using hydroxychloroquine because they see no positive impact. So this may change and lead to another unpredictability in the supply chain. Secondly, hospital uh, distributors also need to manage the hospital crisis demand. They need to limit the minimum order from each hospital so that they can deliver equally to all hospitals. They can't allow any hospital stock up more than normal. And for pharma companies, they are looking at the long-term supply substance. They need to work to have the adequate supply of the AIP and the finished product. In the context of Malaysia, when we look into the trend on the weekly basis to see the, the, the crisis happen and, and the change, we can see that the drug procurement was concentrated into the week when a lot of events happened. For example, going back to early Feb, when the first case of local transmission happened on 7 Feb, and when the number of cases in Malaysia doubled from 8 to 6 in one week, it was a jump in all, in all channels, pharmacy, hospital, and also clinic in terms of the sales. After that straight week, it was a drop. And again, we see another peak during mid-March during the MCO time. So we, distribution is always the key channel, the key factor to drive sales in, in retail in the store. And it becomes even more crucial during the pandemic time. We've seen that the winning brands during the MCO time across all categories, either it's food, either it's healthcare or non-healthcare, is because they can maintain the good stock consistently in the store. That's why that for pharmacy, if in order to drive the sales, having a good stock, having a good product availability in the store is really crucial. So what should be the next step? The COVID-19 has disrupted the healthcare ecosystem and creating an environment that accelerated the digital tools. We at IQV also realized some ways, some changing in the way of working and we want to share with you. Firstly, in terms of the appliance to the CDC uh, checklist recommended by the US CDC, when we talk to doctors, then one in two doctors say that the hospital already taken action more than eight categories listed in the US CDC checklist. 
And uh, in this situation, we can see that digital is unavoidable. We see that technology is become unavoidable in the pandemic time. The lockdown, the MCO, the quarantine has caused the rise of the e-commerce. Just during the first quarter, all the cross merchandising volume in Malaysia increased near to 150% year on year. Of course, offline retail or offline retailer, offline store is still the most favorite channel for consumers. However, we can see absolutely e commerce is now become more important even when everything's getting back to normal nowadays. Secondly, government also implemented certain changes to in order to ensure the continued adherence to treatment and still need to practice the social distancing to help to ease the burden of patients who require to follow up treatment. We see that Malaysia Health Ministry provided the free delivery medicine by post for follow-up patients. And lastly, it's an e-detailing. E I'm not sure that uh, for all the pharmacists here, how many times you have engaged digitally with all the pharmaceutical in the past three months, especially during the MCO time, because we see the e-detail has uh, been replaced on the face-to-face -face visit from medical medref for both doctors and pharmacists via WhatsApp, via Facebook, WeChat, or webinar, or Zoom, or telephone, or email, etc. So, of course, again, face-to-face -face visit is still the top preferred channel so that you can see the people quickly and get on the full download of the information. But e-detailing uh, is now accepted by uh, more than 60% uh, of the healthcare professionals. So we can be, we believe that the COVID-19 pandemic has changed all the industry and so does the healthcare system. Of course, everything happens for a reason and it is really a real test for healthcare industry so that every one of us can keep changing and also keep updated. This also and my stranding here today, uh, I'll leave it to uh, Louis for the next sharing. And uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to connect again in the end of the webinar. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. So that was some nice and interesting data, and I'm sure we'll discuss this at length later when we do the Q&A discussion. Yeah. Sure. Let sure. Me now, um, let me now uh, turn the <coughs> mic to LG, Louis George Lesnery of Zulik Pharma. Uh, I think what he has to say uh, will be much awaited because he has very deep insight of the industry and also the data he has. Over to you, uh, LG. Um, thank you. Do you see my screen or not yet? <coughs> no. Not, not yet, I think. Okay. You see it now? I saw it. Yes. <coughs> Very good. Yep. Yes. Sorry. Yep. Okay. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to join this uh, webinar. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm new to Malaysia. Uh, I've been in Malaysia only uh, since January at Zulik Pharma since now uh, more than five years. So um, this is a very interesting period to join Malaysia in the pharmaceutical industry uh, supply chain uh, during these times. So I will share how we have been uh, quickly, how we have been living this situation from our standpoint as a distributor, uh, supply chain uh, logistic provider. And I will give you some insights, uh, which will be a good complement uh, from the presentation by IQVIA on uh, how we see the impact, specifically on the pharmacy channel, on pharmacy chain uh, channel, and uh, how we see you reacting and how we see the, the market changing um, on the more long term. Uh, a quick slide uh, I've summarized here, uh, how we have experienced as a healthcare distributor, uh, this MCO since now more than three months, uh, being now under RMCO. Uh, you will quickly see all the indicators we have been following uh, since the beginning under this crisis with uh, the key goal to uh, avoid business disruption. And I would say overall, so far, we have seen no major business disruption from importation to distribution to warehousing. Uh, we I'm touching wood. Uh, going out this first wave, we have seen no major disruption. And I would say it's the same for 
our competitors and nevertheless colleagues or the distributors like DKSH, um, no major disruption, uh, no out of stock, no uh, too late deliveries uh, linked to the MCO. Uh, quickly, our sites have remained open uh, during the whole uh, MCO. We were quickly mentioned as an essential um, service provider so we quickly got uh, all the uh, permits from MITI from day one MCO to operate. And we have been able to operate 24-7 uh, every day since the beginning of the MCO. It was big work with the government together with our association to, to get that, but we got it. Staff, um, no one infected so far. Uh, I'm touching wood. Uh, always keeping them safe. It was quite a, a job also for you, I mean, uh, pharmacy chains. Uh, to keep running uh, together with keeping our staff uh, safe. Uh, we put the maximum at the office, all administrative services, call centers uh, work now from the office to allow enough social distancing, less density uh, at, at the office. Now, most of, of our staff are back to, to work uh, on, on site. Same for our sales and marketing people, uh, our med rest, medical reps, since three weeks now, they are back in the field. Uh, they work from home during the MCO, but now they are back on the field. Uh, it's possible to visit pharmacy chains outlets and hospitals mainly, and it's possible, but mainly under appointment. On the order processing uh, side, uh, no disruption during the MCO. Again, we quickly put all our call center working from home uh, with all the equipment necessary, and it worked pretty well. This was a surprise to me to be able to move so many people, uh, such a sensitive part of our uh, process uh, without disruption. It worked relatively well. To the point we may leave on the long term our call centers working from home because it works pretty well. Uh, warehouses, um, nothing to mention uh, special. Uh, they are working now as a routine 24 7 in order to allow shifts and so good social distancing by uh, splitting the work uh, across time. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have got not a single disruption in importation. Uh, everything was produced, shipped, and imported by uh, all our clients uh, as normal. Uh, there, there are always some out of stock, but nothing linked to the MCO. So this was, at the beginning, everybody was afraid about this, the inbound importation part. Uh, but we got not a single disruption uh, linked to MCO. On the delivery side, outbound, delivery to you, customers, uh, again, it was not easy every day. There may have been some little disruption due to some rent zone. On in March, there were big stock piling, so sometimes we are delivering overnight, staying overnight at uh, DCs, especially of pharmacy chains, because orders were huge. But uh, everything was delivered uh, almost on, on time um, uh, during the whole MCO. The thing which is still something we are looking as orange, and I'm sure this is uh, this would be questions uh, in the Q and A. Um, collection is critical. Huh? You all know that supply chain can function if uh, not only the box are moving top down, but the cash flow is moving uh, bottom up. If the cash flow is not moving, the supply chain is blocked uh, instantly. So looking at cash flow was critical for us. Uh, we are fortunate in Malaysia to have a very good practice of online payment, uh, digital payment. So no need of physical payment like in some countries, uh, uh, like Thailand or Vietnam. So technically, there was no need of any contact to collect cash. So this is a good point for Malaysia compared to other countries. And so far, I would say collection, okay. Uh, we always have some deferred payment, default payment from some customers in crisis. But overall, collection is still there almost as normal. Uh, and especially from the pharmacy channel, this is something we have been looking at. There are some very small independent pharmacies who had to close, uh, but it looks they didn't close definitely. They are reopening under RMCO. So, um, so far, so good, I would say, but for sure we're looking at this because with the very low sales level, I will show you even in June, uh, cash flow is reducing. Cash flow is still moving, but the cash is reducing. So in the next three months, um, if the economy is not restarting strongly, uh, there are going to be issues uh, there. Uh, just a quick slide. Some of you may have received uh, these slides. I was not able to send that to everyone, but it was just last week um, uh, a small thanks we sent to uh, most of our clients and customers, the biggest customers, 
just to say thank you also to you. I mean, our staff at Zulig work very hard to, uh, to maintain supply chain 24 seven, even at the worst time in, in March, uh, April. But you also did a great job uh, keeping your outlets open, your staff coming and working and reaching out to, to patients and consumers. It was important for healthcare. It was also important for economy to keep our business running. So uh, just a brief uh, thanks to, to all of you. We all did together, I think, a great job in the um, healthcare and consumer healthcare in whole supply chain industry. Um, few, my, my vision, uh, our vision at Zulig on sales in Malaysia, this is the uh, overall sales, total sales of Zulig, and I will give some more details after that. Just to quickly understand this slide, the, um, the green line, uh, this is our monthly sales every month. The yellow line, it is every month, the sales of the last three months divided by three, MQT divided by three. And the red line, it is the sales every month of the last 12 months divided by 12. This is in order to give a trend. So the red line, it's the last 12 months trend. The yellow line, it's the last three months trend. And the green line, it's the sales every month. And this gives a, a quite a good picture, even if the, the picture is very bad. Uh, this is the MCO on set uh, middle of March. This is the sales in March, the sales in April, the sales in May. And the uh, three months trend, the MAT uh, trend. I think it's no brainer. Huh? You have all experienced that. Uh, stockpiling in March, but not so much, 18% more than MAT. And then a big drop in April. And even more, this was a little surprise, but a posteriori, not so much drop even further on total market. Uh, and I remind to you, Zulik Pharma, it's 75% uh, of all pharma MNCs in uh, Malaysia. Uh, if you count local and generic companies, it's 50% of total pharma market distributed by Zulik in Malaysia. So this gives a good overview. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we were a bit surprised, but thinking about this, not so much because main fact was a small month in terms of working days. We had three or even four work, um, bank holidays, uh, including the end of Ramadan. So in terms of working days, this was a small month compared to last year. So in terms of organic growth, uh, the MTD growth versus last year was very low, but we may gain that, uh, gain that some of it back in June. But overall, MAT, uh, very bad. We are now 2% MAT growth. Usually, Malaysia, it was more than 10. Huh? So a very big impact. If we look by um, segment high level, uh, we have a pharma portfolio, consumer healthcare portfolio, medical device, and animal health. Uh, basically, all of them have been impacted. Uh, so you see the, the, the pharma portfolio, the same picture as I showed before. Medical device have been hit even more strongly because there was no stock up. And basically, from uh, overnight, all um, elective surgery procedures uh, and things like this were postponed sine die. So from no stockpiling in March, uh, the drop was very severe uh, in April and, uh, and continue in May. Animal health, I was not detailed, it's a very specific uh, business with farmers. Consumer health care, uh, behave a bit better. You see the MAT is 5%, while it is flat zero for pharma, because the stockpiling was very big. So then uh, April was reacting to the stockpiling, and you see in May, uh, they were reordering already. So consumer health care was behaving a, a bit better. And we have all noticed, uh, even ourselves, and during the MCO, we have been continuing to consume for ourselves food and personal care. This is the vision by, by channel. It's a bit small, uh, but again, you just have to see the trend. Uh, this is by channel. This is government hospitals, private hospitals, chain pharmacy, independent pharmacy, GP dispensing, and specialist dispensing. Already you see dispensing doctors, they have been hit very, very severely, very severely. Some stockpiling in February, March, but then a huge drop. And we all know dispensing doctors, uh, traffic was extremely, extremely low in April and May. Um, government hospital, uh, they were behaving well as normal uh, until April, a small drop in May, but overall, except hospitals who are focusing on COVID-19 exclusively, uh, activity was rather good. While private hospitals, same as dispensing doctors, little stockpiling in, uh, in March and then a big drop of traffic. Everything was postponed. Uh, patients were not showing up. Elective procedures were all postponed. 
Then coming to what is interesting for us today, uh, pharmacy channel. Uh, you see pharmacy chains, uh, big, uh, big stock. Uh, so this is whole pharma and consumer. I didn't detail, I didn't split. Uh, big stock piling in, um, in uh, March, sorry. Then a drop like all channels in, uh, in April and uh, recovering a little bit uh, in May. Same picture for pharmacy chain. But if you see pharmacy chain, uh, the stock money was really, really big. And the drop was a bit less compared in, uh, in uh, April compared to, um, to pharmacy chain. And so when you look here, the, the MQT is close to the M80. So the trend uh, is still relatively maintained for retail pharmacy. My analysis at my level is that um, the, the pharmacy chains who manage the, the best out of the MCO uh, were the pharmacy chains less exposed on shopping malls and having more shops outside shopping malls, even outside KL, and especially also pharmacy chains, a lot involved on online and e-commerce. And uh, independent pharmacies, by definition, not so much present in shopping malls, but more on street. Uh, patient and consumer were still having access and were not afraid to have access. So basically, independent pharmacies, except the very small, small one, have not been so much impacted. But overall, we know that, and you know that, especially pharmacy chain on the call, the trend of pharmacy chain is very, very strong in Malaysia, while independent pharmacy are, let's say, flat. And this is not changing by the MCO. Um, and now this is also almost my last slide, just to give you a fresh view, because we see your sales, uh, your orders uh, every day. Uh, this is orders, so it's not sales value, it is quantity of orders. Uh, you see, we are used to treat every month uh, around um, almost 4 million uh, orders, sorry, on a weekly basis. Uh, this is weekly. Every point is a week from 1st of January to uh, last week here, the third week of June. And so this is the four weeks of January, the four weeks of April, the four weeks of March, April, May, and June. Uh, in green, this is the orders coming from you, uh, retail. And you see the usual pattern with uh, strong first two weeks and less towards the end of the month. You see the stockpiling many, many orders until the MCO. Uh, we had the first two weeks of March very strong. And then the third week of March, again, very, very strong before the MCO and the drop. April was flat. May and June, we see a little recovery, uh, but not to the extent of back to January, February. And we are still 25% below uh, usual months. We were minus 35 in April. We are still minus 25 in May and still in June. The big spike down and up here, this is end of Ramadan, bank holidays, and the week after Ramadan. But if you avoid the spike on cumul, we are more or less, more or less the same. May and June is similar. Then I will close uh, with this last slide. Uh, uh, just telling you how we see the, the market and all our customers, including you, Pharmacy Change, changing. As it was mentioned by uh, IQVIA before, uh, we see a move uh, to digital. This was already a move before, since um, last five years at least. But for sure, with all the pain felt by some customers, especially dispensing doctors and patient consumers during the MCO, the move to digital is, uh, is increasing. So just a quick note, that's really what we are doing. We are now providing a pharmacy chain. Most of you, you have EDI. Uh, you, you, you can order directly connecting to our SAP. But for smaller pharmacies, we are providing now an ordering uh, online platform called EasyRx, so they can order online by internet. Also, uh, to respond to the problem of connecting with patients, either in pharmacies or in clinic dispensing doctors, we are providing now to the market uh, two tools we launched last year already. Uh, one is already quite well established. One uh, still to be established, Clinify and MedAdvisor. Long story short, these are CRM, Customer Relation Manager, Clinify for clinics, MedAdvisor for pharmacies, to be able to manage uh, your patient database, but also manage communication with your patients. <laughs> Remind them uh, to refill, and we are plugging into that uh, ordering tool for you to be able to manage their prescriptions, manage their orderings and delivery. So uh, that was already on the market. We are developing that. The last piece we do for some of our clients that you know are delivering not only to you, but they put consumer healthcare clients, they put their product on marketplace, on e-commerce. 
we are now cooperating with the e-commerce enablers. So from a unique stock, their stock we have in their warehouse, we can also supply uh, their e-commerce client. So uh, we help them to, uh, to be more present on e-commerce uh, with less complexity because we can manage all that uh, for them. But in pharma, including consumer healthcare, this channel is still very, uh, very small. But we are more focusing on these two solutions, EasyRx and Clinify and uh, MedAdvisor. Uh, this is the end of my presentation and uh, I will take questions uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alvin. So, you know, we to, to look to look at the clock, uh, we now are on the hour, it's one hour now since we've been on the seminar. <coughs> Half an hour or so, it's not fair to hold you beyond that. Everybody's busy. Um, I just want to acknowledge that uh, people are following us on YouTube. Um, all our customers and all our, our partners are following us on YouTube. Um, and um, we, if you have questions or queries, you know, um, shoot it out to me or my team. Uh, in the interim, I could probably ask a few questions, uh, uh, starting maybe with uh, going back again to to LG. LG, uh, how do you think, or what do you see us doing in June? What do you think will be the trend going forward, uh, July? I was interested to see that the farmers' business also barely hit as doctors' business, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. in, uh, and um, what do you think are the trends there? As I was showing in my last slide, uh, June for the moment is looking as bad as May. Uh, we are looking this week, next week, uh, to see if, because it's end of the quarter. Yeah. Uh, it's already uh, a month and uh, after CMCO, uh, two weeks after RMCO. And um, every week uh, we see a better and better news from the government and all over the world. So the, the consumer and patient confidence is growing. Uh, also, we see doctors, clinics, uh, private hospitals are more and more calling their patients to come back because they are struggling with their business. So they are also doing their part of the job. So maybe the end of the month will be uh, we'll see a little rebound, but June will remain low, at least 20% below what we used to see. And when we talk to our clients, all of them are aligned. Uh, we are all aligned together to say, uh, we will not see monthly sales coming back to normal before Q4. If nothing bad is happening, if there is no second wave uh, whatsoever. So this is a bad. This is a pretty bad outlook. Right. Uh, just just for our consumption here, does Dulik Pharma uh, distribute masks? No. Uh, Covid test kits. No. Okay. Uh, because that, that for me would have been indicated. Now, I, you know, I noticed that, you know, we, we thought there was a big movement of sanitizers mm. during that. Oh, yes. We distribute so, uh, Rekit Bankiza. Uh, I mean, mm. we have a few clients and segments uh, which are booming. And uh, yes, uh, sanitizers, we distribute. Uh, Rekit Bankiza uh, is a big player. Right. And the other one was, uh, I thought, vitamin C. Uh, the the uh, people. Yes, uh, yes, vitamin supplement, vitamin and all supplement. We are doing uh, yes, very good in April. Then May, uh, probably because in March, April there were a lot of stockpiling, so May was was less. But overall, yes, companies, consumer healthcare companies in our portfolio are uh, are doing um, yeah rather well. Okay. What, is, what is surprising, it's um, ethical uh, prescription drugs, ethical drugs, except a few exceptions, it's all down, uh, which means that uh, doctors and patients are focusing really on what is chronic and necessary. Mm -hmm. What is not necessary, what is not chronic, uh, is just left. Right. Because, you know, I... I, I know that there was a big surge in people looking for Tamiflu in the pharmacies mm -hmm. uh, in April, March, April. Um, are there any questions from the speak from the participant? 
Uh, there's a question coming, dear speakers, how do you think retail chains or chain pharmacies as a whole can strive back up and move forward post-COVID? What kind of adaptation or changes or even innovation you are suggested? I may take one, one thing here. Uh, the digitalization, I mean, every uh, actor, every stakeholder in the market know what it means, know what can be digitalized. Uh, again, this was fancy so far. This is now becoming uh, necessary. Mm. Uh, yeah. Because cons consumers and patients have changed their habits and... Uh, uh, also, they see it's much if it's much more easy to order online to be delivered at home. Uh, so if it's easy, why, why, why should I move? Right. So it doesn't, right. it doesn't mean they will not go back to shops, uh, but it means there are consumers who will look for that. So we should capture them, and it means if there is a next wave or a next pandemic or a next crisis, this time we cannot say we were not uh, right. we were not informed. So we have to be ready for the next time. Hmm. Um, Anything? Uh, yeah, another thing I think is um, really nowadays um, the impulse shopping has been impacted. For example, before people may go to the shop and window shopping and then impulse shopping happen because normally humans are, are, are not autopilot, especially women shopping. But nowadays this is really seriously impacted because on the procedure in front of the store, we need to scan, we need to register. Therefore, I think that we need to approach the consumer before they go to store. It means that create the need there. So wherever they go and buy, it's on plan. It's on plan in their mind. We need yes. to approach consumer right before that. Um, secondly, I think on the process during the store, it, it has to be very simple and smooth, as simple as it is. For example, sometimes I see some um, from personal experience, I go and I observe people are reluctant to write down using the pen. So we, meet, we must have the barcode and scan or, and make it easier and uh, manage the queue, manage the line so that people can feel confident. Any obstacle, any barriers, they feel reluctant to go to the store. Yeah, uh, to fully agree, your, your first point, uh, especially is very important. Uh, yeah. Again, we see there were impulse shopping and even impulse prescribing. Even on yes. ethical drug, there were some impulse prescribing. And this is gone and this may be gone for long. But to be optimistic, this can be replaced by digital impulse. And uh, now most of us, yes. when we consume consumer goods, we are used to go on Lazada, Amazon. Uh, we Google mm -hmm. and uh, we do some impulse shopping by Googling and going on Amazon. This can happen in consumer healthcare, even ethical yeah. prescription. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really a change of minds for pharma companies, uh, doctors, pharmacies. It, it's, it's a change of the way of working. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, LG and Mice give very good points here. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, moving forward, the back end support to the front end retail is going to be uh, very important as well. Uh, once uh, the consumer or the customers uh, move towards online shopping, so you need a very good infrastructure, digital infrastructure to support uh, the retail front. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I, if I may, throw the question back to all our pharmacies, chain pharmacies uh, viewing now on YouTube and StreamYard, um, you know, what are your thoughts? Because I was concerned the chains will be badly affected because, you know, you are in, um, in malls where A, you're paying a very high rental and B, you're supposed to get the traffic which is not coming, you know, so it's a double impact. Uh, number one, how does it affect you? Number two, what is it that you're doing with your landlords, wherever they are, in Mega Mall or Wanutama or whatever? And um, is there anything that the government is doing that you think can possibly help you make it through? Because this is just, you know, a double whammy. You've got high, high rental and then no traffic.
some people have even suggested that it's going to cause many chain pharmacies to close down, close shops, mm -hmm. uh, close expensive shops that were not returning um, uh, the sales that they were expecting. One question I have here is, uh, thank you for all speakers for the valuable suggestions. Do you think digital impulse on consumers is even harder to capture due to the various digital distractions and short attention span? Uh, very, very good point. <laughs> I think the, um, it's both the challenge, but also the opportunity for us, uh, healthcare provider, the digital impulse should come uh, via the pharmacist and the doctor. Mm. That will not change. Uh, we will remain healthcare provider. So it's us to connect with patients and consumer uh, digitally. And patient and consumer will seek, uh, they will still need doctors, they will still need pharmacies. But um, we shall not wait for them to come to us digitally. We should go to them digitally. It cannot be campaign on Google, uh, blah, blah, internet. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, direct digital interaction, connecting digitally every patient and consumer with uh, their pharmacies, their doctors. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think the, you know, I spoke to uh, a, a major owner of a food chain that all of you know, but I can't mm -hmm. mention the name. Uh, and I was surprised because he said his business has remained intact, you know. Uh, he, what he lost in retail, he has gained in pickup and delivery. Um, mm. And his sales went through the roof during Ramadan, Buka Puasa. And it went through the roof during uh, Raya. So I think, you know, that uh, it's, it's, the business is there. It's how you're going to reach the customer. The traditional retail outlet may be stressed, given the fact that people don't go out or don't want to go out. Or when they go out, they don't want to be out for long, window shopping, and just hanging about or hanging out. So, but consumers need products, they need brands. This is the time when they want to test brands. They want brands they can trust. They want leading brands. They want supply chains they can trust, right? I'm sure Lazada and Shopee would have seen a surge in their business, in their demand. Um, so, you know, before I, 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 I round up, um, any more questions coming from our viewers? Suggestions, comments? Right. So, yes, they can email us. What's the email address they should go to? Okay, the email address, we'll put in the comment section, right? Email us for suggestions, queries, and questions, either to us as a whole or to any one of the panelists. But more importantly, uh, if you want to make recommendations, which I want to share with the government, coming from the industry, from the bowels of industry, because I think that the, unfortunately, the, the rougher days are ahead of us. The next 90 days, the next 120 days will decide a lot of things for a lot of companies. Some have already closed down the smaller ones. The bigger ones will, you know, COVID-19 COVID will not only kill good, uh, weak people, it will kill weak companies and weak businesses. Right? So the next uh, 120 days are going to be very important in terms of how we survive this. Right? Um, so before we before we close, uh, I before I thank all the speakers, the slides. This is the part where we come to rancangan ini di taja ole, right? So uh, I think all pharmacists, you know us, you know our brands. Um, I'm very pleased to share. Um, IQ has just come up with their latest data. Uh, we are the number one fish oil in Malaysia. Right, um, we are in uh, ahead of uh, BioLife, ahead of Cell Labs, ahead of Ensel, ahead of BioLife, ahead of uh, Fitol, Aspen. For this, all data coming from from Ikevia, Right, we are very pleased. It's a very difficult market. It's a very tough market to stay ahead. Um, has been extremely competitive market. But you know, I want to tell everybody that it is because consumers trust us. Uh, we are the only brand that has gone out year after year and said, 
full money back guarantee if you find impurities of any sort. Right? The last two years now we run a campaign, one million ringgit. If you can find any toxin in any amount in any pharmacy at any time, right? None of our competitors have dared make that kind of a challenge, right? And when we launched, we were in parts per million. That's what the ministry wanted. Then we went to parts per billion. Then we went to parts per trillion. And now we are at parts per sub-trillion. We work with the largest fish oil player in the world, EPAX. Uh, the innovation that we have constantly is making the product purer and purer and purer. And as you know, the oceans are full of toxins, they're full of microplastics, uh, PCBs and heavy metals and lithium batteries being thrown in. You really don't want to have those toxins. So consumers trust us, right? And we are the most trusted consumer brand for fish oil. I think now eight years or 10 years now in a row, we are the market leader, right? Uh, another piece of good news is next. We are also the market leader for probiotics. In fact, in probiotics, we have a significant market leadership now, right? We are ahead of everybody else. And again, you know, this is a very amazing story, I must tell you all, that uh, we went to develop the world's first locally derived probiotics. We went and worked with Malacca Biotech. We went to find um, uh, uh, breast milk for mothers who are breastfeeding, who are antibiotic free for 10 years. We took, the, we took the probiotics from there. Then we went to soil in Malacca, fruits, fruit trees in Malacca, dirt in Malacca, cows, um, cows milk in Malacca, picked up the varieties. These were then sent to India to be enhanced biotechnologically to have these five probiotics, three that work in the lower intestine, two that work in the larger intestine. And um, the product works because local probiotics will stay longer in our gut because until 30 years ago, everything we ate was local. All the germs were local. All the probiotics were local. Um, it's only now we import from Japan and, and Korea and um, Canada and Australia. But our local guts, are, our local probiotics like us to eat nasi lemak in the morning and roti chanai for lunch and have uh, char siu pao for, for supper, right? So our gut, our gut has adapted to that and therefore we, and that's why our product does well because it does work. People who take it tell me my burping is gone, my bloating is gone, my gas is gone, I got more regular bowels, right? And therefore we are increasing our market share uh, with Nielsen ahead of again everybody else. And once again, I thank our consumers, but also thank our pharmacists for supporting us. Now, in the middle of all this, next slide, right? We launched or just introducing now a sanitizer, which I believe next year, when um, IQVIA does the market study, we will be the number one sanitizer in Malaysia for the non alcohol category, right? Because unlike the alcohol, and everybody's packed with alcohols, alcohols last for 20 minutes. You've got to keep sanitizing every half an hour. Uh, ours is silver, it lasts for 24 hours. It's the highest concentration, 70, 70, 70 parts per, per million. Um, it's totally non-toxic. You can drink it, you can swallow it, you can spray it into your face, you can spray, wash your eyes with it. It's alcohol-free, it's completely non-flammable, right? And there's a long history of um, using silver. In the Roman times, right, the rich Romans used to pour the silver into silver bowls leave it overnight, drink it with a silver spoon in the morning. And that's why the term born with a silver spoon in the mouth came about. Right? And when they took that very often, uh, if they have a fair skin like, well, like algae, then they get a bluish hue on their skin and that's how the term blue bloods came about. Right? And we know that silver kills everything and hence silver bullet. I've got the silver bullet. Right? And silver is safe. We use it in burns. You, know, you can drink it. It's completely safe. And you know, we're launching it now in the pharmacies. Uh, this month and next month, uh, we, we think in the second wave, um, people will be smarter. They won't be taking alcohol. Uh, alcohol sanitizers are, don't work as well. They're irritant, right? And they don't last long. So we're launching our silver bullet. Uh, and I'm sure my sales colleagues will be approaching um, uh, the pharmacist. You know, for, for this, you know? So... Uh, once again, before I go, uh, I want to thank all of you, uh, the panelists, uh, 
many my and LG and I want to thank all of you for taking time to join us. Thank you very much. Wishing you all the best in 2020. I know it started very, poor, uh, very poorly, right? They say, can we reinstall 20, the version 2020? There's a virus in it, right? So let's see what we can do uh, together uh, as an industry to improve our lot. And we would like from this seminar to have some suggestions for the government, how we can better uh, cope with this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.